Hi guys, the video today is a review of the movie Gravity with uh, Sandra Bullock and George Clooney. Um, so I saw it last night, so I just wanted to give you guys a review. Um, and I wanted to give you my thoughts. So um, the first thing I thought after walking out of the movie theater is that the movie is basically a meditation on fear, loneliness, and death. Um, you know, I see some people are debating on how to categorize it. Like, um, I saw on Rotten Tomatoes it was called a sci-fi thriller. It's not a thriller, okay? Like, Pandorum was a sci-fi thriller. Um, if you want to say this was sci-fi because it was set in space, then I guess that's okay. Um, if I was asked to describe it, I would really say it's more of a drama, and like I said, a meditation on fear, loneliness, and death. Um, just to put this out there, I mean, you saw it in the title too, there are tons of spoilers in this review. So if you haven't seen Gravity and you plan on seeing it, you know, stop watching this because, you know, I'm basically going to spoil the whole movie for you. Um, so there's a part of the movie where um, Sandra Bullock's character's name is Dr. Stone, and uh, George Clooney's character's name uh, is Kowalski, like they all call him by his last name. So there's a part of the movie where Dr. Stone, she says, everyone knows they're going to die, but I didn't know I was going to die today. And like that's kind of indicative of how the movie is. Um, you know, she's basically placed in one life-threatening situation after another. Um, you know, I did really like that the film showed um, Stone's vulnerability, terror, and fear throughout all the situations um, she's put in. And I guess I'll back up a little bit. I mean, um, what basically happens is Stone and Kowalski are on a mission to repair the Hubble um, telescope in space. So they're doing a spacewalk, I believe, and they're repairing it. And I think what happens is, I, I don't remember what causes the chain reaction, but there's basically debris that's flying through space towards where they are. And it's going really fast, okay, so fast that one of their colleagues gets hit by it in the face and it literally like obliterates half of his face. So that's basically, that's where the action, that's, you know, that's basically the setup for the movie. Um, it basically destroys, it doesn't completely destroy, but basically destroys the, the um, Hubble. So it's about Stone trying to find a way to survive, basically, um, to get to a space station and then get back to Earth. So. Anyway, like I was saying, I really like that the film showed <clears throat> Stone's vulnerability, terror, and fear throughout all the situations she gets put in. Um, you know, there's uh, her, her space suit is running out of oxygen, and it, there's a monitor that blinks inside of the suit. So it's showing that she's at 9% oxygen and 8%, you know, and you're just floating in the expanse of space, and, you know, it's terrifying. Like, she doesn't know if she's ever going to be able to get back, and then there's a later point where... The oxygen completely runs out, so she's breathing in um, CO2, and she almost passes out. Things like that. Um, she eventually floats to a um, space station, the Soyuz, a Russian space spacecraft, I guess. Um, and she's going to, you know, basically try to use it to get back to Earth. And um, she finds out that it's run out of fuel. Or, you know, so that's like another obstacle. There's another part of the movie right after she boards the, the Soyuz where there's a fire, you know? So it's like all these things keep happening to her again and again in pretty quick succession. So um, I just liked it because I just see that a lot of times uh, the main characters in like movies or TV shows, like when they're faced with their own death, um, it's usually like a lot of times they're shown as being courageous without any fear. And, you know, um, Kowalski, that is how he dies, you know? Like he, he doesn't panic, whatever, right? My point is, though, obviously Stone is the main character of the movie. I mean, George Clooney and Kowalski's character dies before the first 15 minutes of the film is up. So the remaining, the movie I think is 91 minutes long, so the remaining portion of the movie, it's all Stone. So anyway, my point is, I just like that they actually show her reacting like I think most people would react in that situation. Um, something I thought of, if any of you guys have seen Firefly, there's an episode where basically the ship... Um, is compromised, and Mal, the captain, Nathan Fillion's character, decides that he's not going to abandon the ship, so all of his other, you know, crewmates, you know, decide to leave so that they don't die, but, you know, he refuses, like, he's old school like that, and he thinks that the captain of the ship should go down with the ship. So there's a part where, like, kind of his love interest, but they never really get together during the show, and Nara um, says something to him, like, you know, you don't have to stay in Serenity and die alone, because this is as all of them are leaving him there. 
and he replies, everybody dies alone. You know, so like that's kind of what I'm used to seeing, like that kind of bravado and that courage. Um, what really made me want to see Gravity was there's a part of the commercial where you see Dr. Stone and she just says, I'm really scared, you know? But she says it in such a vulnerable um, tone of voice and there's like a close-up on her face. You can see that she's pale, like her face is drawn, she's exhausted. You can see she's been crying and there's like tears rolling down her face. Um, it's just a very like sparse moment as well. Like there's no, you know, over dramatic, sweeping, like background music accompanying the moment. Like there's nothing. It's really just her in the frame, kind of as I've described. And, um, you know, I just feel like that's kind of a rare moment in movies nowadays. Like even when you get a dramatic moment like that, there's usually so much else that's going on in the background. So I, that's really what compelled me to see the movie. Um, you know, the movie also looks into our reactions to impending death. Um, you know, basically there's a part of the film, like I said, she's on the Russian spacecraft and she discovers that it's out of fuel. So, you know, at that part of the movie, she, th you know, she thinks she's imminently about to die. So she's picking up, um, like a radio frequency of like a, you know, basically like a guy in China talking to his baby or whatever. And like, there's a dog barking and stuff like that. Just kind of a scene where that's going on. Um, and she basically asks the guy, you know, can you say a prayer for me? Um, and then later on in the dialogue, she says that no one ever taught me how to pray. You know, and I just think that, and also beyond that, there's a lot of religious um, imagery in the movie. Um, I know on the Soyuz, you see a picture. Um, honestly, guys, I've, I've seen it one time. I don't know if it was Jesus Christ. I don't know if it was a saint, okay? But it was definitely, like, it looked to me to be Catholic imagery. It was, like, taped up to the controls on, on the Russian spacecraft. And then when she got to the Chinese spacecraft, um, you see, like, a miniature statue of Buddha. So, you know, like I said, there was a lot of religious um, imagery in the movie and stuff like that. And I think it's was in there just to point to the fact that a lot of people right before death, like in the moments leading up to their death, um, even if you're atheist or agnostic or, or apathetic, whatever the case might be, a lot of people tend to just think of whether it's spirituality, a higher power, you know, or just, even if it's not all that, like, what's basically going to happen to me now? Like, if you know you're about to die, it's like, is there an afterlife? You know, do I just cease to exist? So I think that's why there was so much religious imagery in the movie, because it's just pointing to that fact. Because, you know, basically that's the entire movie. Like, you just see Stone going through all, like I said, these life-threatening situations. Um... You know, the movie explores loneliness, um, obviously, you know, and I, again, I don't remember exactly what it says, but the movie opens with text, just saying that obviously in space, it's a vacuum, there's no oxygen, there's nothing to carry or transmit sound, it's just kind of this cold, harsh, relentless, like, unforgiving expanse of space. Um, you know, and they were, there were very long takes in the film where there was literally no sound, like, there was no background music. There was no dialogue, there was nobody talking, and I think that was a really effective um, way to film the movie, because that puts you in the characters, like, you can experience kind of what the characters are experiencing, you know, because obviously for Stone, that's what she was going through, like, there was no sound, there was nothing, so like, you know, I, I like that, and I, I, again, I think that's, well, also, I think it added kind of a degree of realism to the movie, because that's what it would be like if you were in space. Um, also, again, like I said, I think that's pretty rare in movies of today. Most movies of today have very quick edits, very quick cuts. Like, it's basically, they're almost like a music video. Like, really, if you think about it, they're almost like commercials. Um, you know, and I think it's because people generally today have shorter attention spans. Like, you know, with the whole, like, most people are really addicted to their smartphones, with Facebook, with Twitter. Just the internet in general and social networking, people, I think, have shorter attention spans today than they did in the past. And, you know, I, I do watch a lot of classic films. I'm a huge um, Gary Cooper fan. I love Doris Day. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and list all the classic actors that I like, okay? But I like a lot of classic movies like High Noon, Pillow Talk, like, et cetera, et cetera, okay? 
and you can see the difference between movies back then and movies today. So, um, you know, like I said, I think that this was a brave film. Like I do. I think that it was pretty ambitious in today's day and age to have such long takes where, in a way, quote unquote, there's nothing happening, you know? Like you're looking at stone floating, you know, for a couple of minutes and there's no sound. Like, I really like that about this movie. And like I said, I think it's very ambitious to, to do that in today's day and age, you know? Because people are really like... Okay, I'll put it like this. Obviously, if you've looked up the movie, it's got 98% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. And when I went to IMDb yesterday, when I got home from the movie, it had an 8.6 on IMDb, okay? And it's beloved by critics. I think it's going to win Best Film at the Oscars. I definitely think Sandra Bullock's going to be nominated. I get all that. I'm just saying that with a film like this, you risk people being like, well, this is fucking stupid. Nothing happened for an hour and a half. Do you know what I mean? So, like, that's what I mean when I say, like, I think it's an ambitious thing to do because nobody, there are very few films that do this. I know a lot of independent films do. I'm talking more like the mainstream films that get released by Hollywood. So, um, I really like that about the movie. Um, I also like that there were no flashbacks used. Um, I really enjoyed that. I think it's a very overused narrative device in films today. And um, to give you an example, I think that a lesser film, the part where Dr. Stone tells Kowalski that her four-year-old daughter died, I definitely think a lesser director would have put some kind of flashback there. You know, I'm not saying... So the four-year-old daughter, what happens is she's playing at school, she trips, she hits her head, and she dies. Like, it's that's it. It's that immediate, it's that random. I just think, you know, in a lesser movie, you would have had a flashback to the daughter, or like, you know, she tells Kowalski that, I can't remember, like, she got the call while she was driving or something, and that was it. Like, I mean, you know, her daughter was dead. Like, I liked that it you know, the film didn't break itself up to include a flashback. Because I think a lot of times flashbacks can take you out of the film. Like, it can take you out of the experience of the film. Um, you know? And with this, you know, she tells Kowalski that, and, like, the moment kind of just sits there, like like how it would do in real life. So, again, I mean, I like that, and I think that's another thing, um, kind of what I'm saying. Like, I think the film makes pretty ambitious choices, and it's pretty unique.